The year 1966 was a critical year in the history of Nigeria. It was the year that Nigeria witnessed two bloody coups in quick successions. While the first coup was executed in January 1966, the second coup was executed in July of the same year. These events will shape and change the course of Nigeria's military, economic and political history forever. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. The first military coup in Nigeria was carried out by a group of majors in the Nigerian army led by Major Chukuma Kaduna Nzeogu. At the end of the exercise, not less than 22 persons were killed in the coup. But the coup plotters were unable to take over the reins of power as their efforts were frustrated by other army officers who were not happy with the development. Following the failure of Nzeogu's coup, General Agui Ronsi, who was the most senior military officer at the time and who was the general officer commanding the Nigerian army, became the military head of state. Ironsi appointed military governors and began the administration of the country. But there was tension, disquiet, and civil disturbances in many parts of the country as a direct fallout of the gruesome massacre of several persons in the course of Nzergo school. Some of the persons that were assassinated, when counted one by one, were leading political and military officers from the northern region of Nigeria. In his efforts to restore peace to the country, Ironsi took a decision to make a tour of the country and have discussions with traditional rulers and leaders of thought on the need to maintain peace. This singular decision will later cost Ironsi's life in not less than seven months of his presidency. A timetable was drawn for the tour and the tour was scheduled to start from the western region of Nigeria precisely in Ibadan, which was the capital of the region. Ironsi left his residence in Lagos in the company of some staff of the army headquarters and his personal security aides. The date of the departure from Lagos to Ibadan was July 28, 1966. They arrived safely in Ibadan and were received by the military governor of the western region, Colonel Adekunle Fajui. The meeting with the royal fathers and leaders of thought held successfully as was scheduled. After the meeting, Irosi had an option to return to Lagos, but he decided to spend the night at the government house in Ibadan with Adekunle Fajui as his host. When night came, Irosi went to bed. Unknown to Irosi, he was not going to wake up to continue in office as military head of state of Nigeria. His tenure was ending in no time. His life was also going to end in a matter of hours. In the early hours of the morning of 29th July 1966, at about 4 or 5 a.m., the government house Ibadan was invaded by a group of soldiers led by Major T.Y. Danjuma. The soldiers on duty at the government house were disarmed and their weapons were taken over by soldiers loyal to Danjuma. Danjuma's soldiers positioned themselves strategically around the building and ready for a showdown. On sensing that something was wrong, Colonel Adekunle Fajui, the military governor and host of the head of state, sent some soldiers that were with him in the building to go downstairs and see what exactly was going on. One of the soldiers that was sent out by Colonel Adekunle Fajui was Air Force Captain Andrew Nwankwo who was the ADC to Ironsi at the time. As Nwankwo went down, he was arrested by Danjuma soldiers, disarmed, his shoes taken off and he was made to sit on the floor. 
every other person that emerged from the main building was treated the same way and no one returned to the building to brave Fajuyi and Ironsi of what transpired downstairs and what transpired around the compound. Fajuyi then decided to come down by himself. At this time, Danjuma had already advanced to the main building. As Fajuyi came down the staircase, he met Danjuma, who saluted him as a senior officer, but who immediately told him that he was under arrest. Fajuyi knew as a soldier that anything could happen to him at that point. He thus raised his hands and came down peacefully and asked Danjuma what he wanted. Danjuma responded, we want to arrest the head of state and leave the government house with him. It is reported that Fajiyi pleaded with Danjuma not to go up with armed soldiers, that he was going to go up and call Ironsi for him, but that he, Danjuma, should please guarantee him the safety of Ironsi, who was his guest. Danjuma guaranteed the needed safety. And Fajiyu went upstairs to discuss with Ironsi, but did not return to Danjuma immediately. Danjuma then climbed up with a grenade in his hands. He met Ironsi with Fajiyu, discussing together, and Danjuma immediately told Ironsi that he was under arrest and gave him the order to stand up immediately. Reluctantly, Ironsi a most senior officer to Danjuma and the military head of state at the time stood up as was commanded by this military major T.Y. Danjuma. At this time, the soldiers that came with Danjuma were on hand to obey whatever was required of them by Danjuma. They were pushed for a showdown. Ironsi was laid downstairs and forced into a waiting vehicle. Fajui also entered the vehicle and both of them were driven out to an unknown destination. That was the last time these two men were seen alive together. They were driven to a place called La Lukbon on the outskirts of Ibadan where they were shot, killed and buried in a shallow grave by their captors. It is reported that before they were eventually shot, the soldiers commanded Ironsi out of the vehicle into the bush for elimination. It is also reported Fajiyi ran between the soldiers and spread his hands begging them not to kill Ironsi. Fajiyi literally prevented them from shooting Ironsi for several minutes and kept begging them not to kill him. He repeated the intervention so much that the killers became frustrated and angrily fired shots into Fajui and Ironsi at the same time. Fajui is thus said to have died in defense of a friend and a compatriot. This event ended forever the lives, career and times of the two of the earliest foreign trained and highly experienced Nigerian military officers, General Johnson Agui Ironsi and Colonel Adekunle Fajui. At the time of the coup, T.Y. Danjuma was only 26 years old. The smooth execution of the coup and the coordination between the officers in Ibadan and Lagos showed clearly that the coup had already been planned and was only waiting for an opportunity to strike. Ibadan only presented a perfect opportunity to strike and execute the coup. The officers that we eventually identified as the brains behind the coup from the Lagos flank were Lieutenant Colonel Motala Mohammed, Lieutenant Ibrahim Babangida, Martin Adamu, Joseph Gaba, Nuhu Nathan, Malami Nasarawa, Paul Tafa, Musa Usman, Second Lieutenant Sani Abacha, and Shito Alau, and many others. Those from the Ibadan flank were 
Gaba Dada, Jeremiah Useni, and Lieutenant Ibrahim Bako. These officers from Ibadan flank were assisted by T.Y. Danjuma and William Walbe. Danjuma and Walbe were originally part of the Lagos group, but being part of General Ironsi's guard, they participated by default as they accompanied Ironsi on his official tour of the western region of the country. The Lagos group used the Keja barracks as their operational base, while the Ibadan group used the 4th Battalion as their operational base. It is reported that the trouble which ignited the coup started in the army barracks in Abeokota, where some junior officers of the Northern Extraction opened fire and killed several officers of Igbo Extraction who were seen having a meeting at the barracks on the night of Iran's arrival in Ibadan. Danjuma then seized the opportunity of the confusion of the moment to carry out the coup and remove the Ronsi from power. Analysts have however queried the relationship between the killing of soldiers in an army barracks in Abeokota and the arrest and eventual killing of the head of state in Ibadan. When it was clear that the Ronsi had effectively been taken out of the way, the next phase in the coup was to choose a successor from the remaining senior military officers in the country. Lieutenant Colonel Yakubo Gawon, a Christian from the Plateau region of Nigeria and the Chief of Staff to General Ironsi, was chosen as the new Head of State. It is said that his choice as the new Head of State annoyed some of the coup plotters such as Motala Mohammed, who was keenly interested in the said office. This anger would later play out years after as Motala Mohammed would also seize power from Gowon, but in a bloodless coup. The other officers that participated one way or the other in the coup were rewarded with key military appointments by the Gowon administration. You are watching the story of the second military coup in Nigeria. Adekule Fajui was born on 26 June 1926. He was from Ado Ikiti in present-day Ikiti State. Originally a teacher and a clerk, Fajui joined the Nigerian Army in 1943. He was trained at the Eton Hall Officer Candidate School in the United Kingdom. He served in the Congo and on return from Congo, he became the first indigenous military commander of the 1st Battalion in Ugu. When Major General Agui Ronsi became the head of state, Ironsi appointed military governors for the regions and Faji was appointed as governor of the western region of the country. Faji is remembered by many as a gallant soldier who served his country with commitment, loyalty and dedication. The second division of the Nigerian army pardon, is officially known as a Adekunle Fajui cantonment named in honor of Colonel Adekunle Fajui. On the other hand, Agui Ronsi was born on the third day of March 1924. He had his primary and secondary education in Umwaya, Calabar and Kano respectively and at the age of 18 he enrolled in the then Nigerian regiment as a private. He later proceeded to the Staff College Camberley, England. He served as commandant of the 5th Battalion Kano served at the Congo under the United Nations and later served as military attaché to the Nigerian High Commission in London. Ironsi rose through the ranks and became a major general in the Nigerian army in 1965 and in the same year he became the general officer commanding the Nigerian army. Ironsi's body was later exhumed from the shallow grave and properly buried with full military honors and in accordance with the funeral rites of the Catholic Church where Ironsi was a devout worshipper. He was 42 years old when he became the military head of state of Nigeria and was also 42 years old at the time of his assassination. Ironsi was only in power for six months. The story of the second military coup in Nigeria is a story of revenge, 
bloodletting and hunger for power. Thank you for watching this edition of Back in History and do remember to subscribe to the channel for regular notifications.